Thank you. So, uh, for those of you that I haven't met, which probably makes about half the room vision by all the new people, um, my name is James McNally. I am from Washington Technology. I'm an alliance partner in the UK. And one of the things I've been kind of wanting to talk about something like this for a while is web security. Um, and I've kind of put it off because I'm not an expert, but as I said in the last presentation, I only need to be one step ahead. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully uh, I can help a few of you kind of make the next step up uh, as needed with it. So, and the reasons why to talk about this, you know, you're probably all well aware. Um, things are changing, especially lately. Uh, there's more and more dependence on cloud computing. Um, there's more and more talk about the Internet of Things, the IoT. And what that really does is drag us from our area in kind of generally operational technology into the IT world, into working with the web where normally the web has been a dangerous place that we don't touch. Um, and it still is a dangerous place. We've just got to learn how to use it safely. Uh, so that's why I wanted to talk, to this, talk about this uh, to you all to hopefully start us thinking about what we can do better in this area. Um, and obviously the web industry and the hackers have a kind of 20 year head start on us. So we need to catch up quickly. Um, and needless to say, you know, there's been various examples of um, devices being hacked over the web. Uh, Stuxnet is an example of a, an industrial attack. It's going to come up and up in the news more and more. And if you're an alliance partner, your customers are probably going to start asking about it more. If you're an employee, your bosses are probably going to start asking about it more as we see more and more of this. So for this presentation, um, I originally cut a load of stuff out and wanted to just talk about network security. So this is based around a project I worked on. It isn't exactly the project I've worked on, but I'm using this kind of a template um, just to give some frame to the presentation. <coughs> I'm going to focus on kind of having lab view devices, so kind of a lab view client. I'm not going to talk about the server side so much. And I'm going to focus on network security because I can't talk about it all. <laughs> Even within network security, when I practiced this presentation, I had about five or six points and I've had to cut it down to three to make it fit. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. Um, but I wanted to mention network security really is one part of this. Um, social engineering is another important thing which is very hard. So, for example, if you remember a couple of years ago, a lot, a lot of celebrities had their uh, iCloud accounts hacked. Um, there was no real clever technology in that. It was all social engineering. It was phoning up helplines and pretending to be people and convincing people to give up information. Um, I'm not going to talk about physical access, but I think this is a very important one for us. I can do everything I want to secure a device. If someone can open the cabinet and reprogram the compact Rio by plugging into it, then <laughs> it doesn't matter how secure your network is. Um, and the other one is reverse engineering. I think this is maybe a more classic security topic. This is someone you know, taking, getting a copy of your program and working out how it works in order to try and find a way to exploit it. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that because honestly I don't know very much about it. And that's another whole topic uh, as well. <coughs> So the project concept is kind of outlined in this diagram. So we have up at the top uh, a web server. So this is running in the cloud. Um, so it's publicly accessible to end users of the, the devices who load a web page to view the data. And also we have multiple devices which are sending data to the server through, the, through a, a 3G connection, in this case a GSM connection. Um, and the concept behind this is these devices are taking measurements, so we may have sensitive data, and you can send some commands to those devices as well. So we need to make sure that's done secure. So I'm going to talk about a few of the key concepts that we did to secure this. Um, essentially, I was new to this when I started this, so uh, all of these concepts, what I did was, was actually hired some time with a security consultant to look into trying to make this secure as appropriate. Um, so I'm fairly confident in these things. These aren't the be-all and end-all, um, but they, they will give you a good start. So the first one is data encryption. Um, so this is something I imagine everybody has heard about. <laughs> um, this is really all about sending data in a way that prevents two main ways that people might exploit the system. 
Um, the first is eavesdropping. So if you're in a internet ca in a cafe on public Wi-Fi and someone has the right equipment, they can simply listen to all of the data that's going back and forward between your client and your server. And so by encrypting the data, we make it unintelligible for them. They can't understand what that data is. The other thing this prevents is data replay attacks. Um, so what this means is, in this case, when we have some command capability, we can tell these devices to perhaps reset. And what someone could do in that case is they could record that data, and then they could say, well, I know that's a reset command, so now when I want to reset that device, I'll just send it to the server again in the same way. But if we encrypt that data, um, and use some other techniques, we'll see we make that much harder for them to do because they don't know what the command is, how it works, or any of the structure of it. Excuse me. Excuse yes. A little bit loud, yeah? Hold that up there. <laughs> so the other thing that data encryption helps us do is reduces some of our exposure to other attacks. So a man in the middle attack is where if I, well, I thought, think I'm logged into my server, but actually I'm logged into Richard's server, and then he may still pass on the data to the server, but he might manipulate it on the way. And so if that data's encrypted, that's much harder for him to do. And also application attacks. So what I mean by this is, again, kind of, if Richard's, <laughs> sorry Richard, you're going to play the bad guy today. <laughs> Um, if if uh, Richard takes that data and he can look at the particular protocols I'm using, how that system is working, to try and work out how to defeat it, how to, to find a way. So the thing I found interesting with this talk is that I originally thought I'd have lots of wonderful lab code to show you. Um, but in reality, a lot of this is baked in. So um, really, the system I used for this was we used HTTPS. So, if, uh, if you haven't heard of it or, or aren't familiar with it, so HTTP is our basic system for running web pages over the web. And if you use a RESTful client in Lavi, it uses HTTP. HTTPS is just an extension to that to encrypt the data. And that is just supported by the LabVIEW HTTP client out of the box. Um, so let me explain a little bit how it works and I'll just show you what that means in LabVIEW. So this is where I get a little bit more technical. Um, there's two different types of encryption in, used widely on the web. The first is what I was familiar with before I started looking into this. It's called symmetric encryption. And this is the idea that uh, if we have... I, I was told Bob and Alice is the classic example for encryption examples. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why. Um, if we have Bob and Alice that want to share some data safely, what they do is they pre-agree a key. Uh, or a password, for example. And so we have algorithms that Bob can use the key to encrypt the data, and then Alice uses the same key to decrypt the data. <coughs> and this is good because it's very fast and efficient. You can imagine if you're on Compact Rio that, or some other LabVIEW device, that's very easy to implement. You just have to save that password on both devices. The struggle with this is if Alice accidentally shares her key with someone else, now there's a third party that can decrypt that data. So the other type of encryption you'll see a lot on the web is called asymmetric <coughs> encryption. Um, what this does is it uses a pair of mathematically generated keys. Don't ask me how the math works. I have no idea. I have some commands I type in and it does it for me. <laughs> uh, but the idea is that a Alice would have a private key and a public key. And they're mathematically linked, so she can provide Bob with her public key. He can encrypt some data using that public key, so we still have encrypted data in the middle. But now that data can only be decrypted with her private key. So what that means is, as long as she keeps her private key safe, she can give her public key to many people, and still look, they can't ever decrypt this information. So this is very popular, and this is something of the basis for HTTPS. Um, what it actually does is first it uses asymmetric encryption to share a key with symmetric encryption. So that's why I introduced both of them, because they're actually both used under the hood. Um, and the reason why they would do that rather than just using one 
is because symmetric encryption is much, much faster and, and more efficient to run um, than asymmetric encryption. So with all of that said, this is very, very simple to do in that case. Um, so I've set up, and hopefully it's still running, I was saying earlier, I think doing stuff with networking is the same as working with children in TV. Uh, <laughs> it's a very risky game. Uh, but here I have a um, web server set up. And this is just running on a virtual machine. And we have a page that we can load over HTTP or HTTPS. And in the background, <laughs> OK, we'll skip that. <laughs> um, in the background, what I had was just some packet capture software running. And so when you run that packet capture software, when I just put in HTTP, we can see all of the plain text of the web page coming back. And more worryingly would be if I was putting my password or something like that into here, we just see the text. Whereas as soon as I go to HTTPS, that text is rubbish as far as I can read, um, and it's protected by that encryption. In LabVIEW, <laughs> that example looks like this. So very simply, all we're going to do is uh, we use the HTTP client VIs. In actual fact, this middle VI isn't necessary. Um, and I can provide that URL in either form. And LabVIEW will detect which format I'm supposed to be using. Mm -hmm. If I turn off, this bit will be explained momentarily. <laughs> if I turn off that. And LabVIEW will detect that and basically operate on the secure messaging if we specify HTTPS. So that has to be supported by the server. Uh, the LabVIEW servers all have it built in and, and all the kind of common web servers would do as well. So, um, the first you know, basic thing I would say is if you're using any kind of RESTful API over the web, you should be using this secure form. Because to be honest, it's really easy and it gives you a much higher level of protection. Um, so there's not really many excuses to not use it. So that's the, the kind of the first challenge is hiding that data, making it so that other people can't take that data and, and replay it, as they say, or, or um, perform other attacks with that. But the other problem I had is how do I know I'm talking to the right server? So I'm putting these devices out into the field and I give them a web address. But what happens if someone can pretend to be that address? Um, and that's where kind of server identification becomes an issue. Um, I don't want someone to be able to, uh, and this is the, the kind of man in the middle attack scenario. I don't want Richard to be able to set up his own server that pretends to be my server and then capture all of that information. Uh, or, even worse, send commands to those devices. So again, <laughs> this is where this turned out to be as not a much larger as I expected. Actually, this is part of HTTPS as well. So you may have spotted when my site first came up, it said HTTPS but not secure. And the reason for that is it's failed the identity check. So what HTTPS also supports is an idea called certificate authorities. So I mentioned that the way that we do that asymmetric encryption is we need a key, a public key. So what the web does is my server takes that public key and puts it into what's called a certificate. Because that takes that public key, it also adds the web address that it should be tied to. So if you're on google.com but you receive a key for you know, maliciouswebsite.com <laughs> instead, your website will flag that. Obviously then you're still depending on that server to provide you with that certificate. So we need to verify those certificates as well. So the web has a network of trusted certificate authorities. Um, so there's kind of five or six major ones that 
Your laptop is already configured to trust. Um, so Komodo is one, if you ever see that name, uh, turn up for example. So what happens is, when I set up a new web server with HTTPS, I generate a certificate and I send it to Komodo or another provider to sign that. So when I connect to the web server, I download the certificate and it says, oh, it's signed by Komodo. And the, the client or the device can say, well, do I trust Komodo? Do I believe that they would only sign good certificates? Um, and this allows us to have some protection against people pretending to be a site that they are. Uh, there was a good example of this being completely broken by um, Lenovo. They, on their cheaper laptops, they put in something called Superfish, which is a bit of software to inject adverts into websites. So even though the website didn't have adverts on, they could put adverts into the web page when you were using the browser. Um, and there was a big fuss about that because what it basically said is trust all certificates. <laughs> <laughs> and that enabled them to kind of intercept that data. It was effectively a man-in-the-middle attack, even though it was sort of intentional. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, my server has what's called a self-signed certificate. So I haven't had it signed by a certificate authority uh, because that costs money. Um, <laughs> so that's why I get that security error. Yeah. There's not encrypt on there, so you should Yes, yeah, I haven't had a proper look at it, but you're right, so there's a company called Let's Encrypt, which is trying to provide free certificates to everybody um, to basically make this more widespread. So let's say, if you're running a website, there's really, you get so much extra protection for very little effort uh, with HTTPS that it's, it's worth doing. So in my browser, I get this not secure, um, and the reason for that is we can go in and see the certificate, I don't know how big that is on the screen, but it says there's an issue, the certificate authority is invalid. So it's seen the certificate, it's encrypted the information, but my browser is warning me that I don't know that I trust this website. So we have the same thing in LabVIEW, which is what that button was that I was flipping over <laughs> from true to false. Um, we can specify here, either on this <laughs> configure SSL box, or when we create a HTTP handle to say whether to verify the server. And what that does is that tells LabVIEW whether to check with certificate authorities um, that this, is, this has been signed or not. So when I had that turned on, because this is an invalid certificate, that's why I got that error to say that this isn't a valid connection. What you can do is actually set up your own certificate authority as well. So you can create your own certificate to sign, uh, well it's a certificate to sign a certificate. <laughs> and I can specify to allow you trust things that are only trust things that are signed by the certificate. And that gives us an extra level of protection because now we're not dependent on the outside world to sign these, only we can sign valid certificates. The problem with that is, if you think there's a chance that that certificate gets compromised for some reason, so if the private key for that certificate gets lost, you need to be able to tell these devices, don't trust that one anymore, <coughs> trust this one instead. And so you need a way to potentially update your code that doesn't depend on that web server to, to tell it now, trust these devices instead. So this is where it starts to get a little trickier. <laughs> um, but it, it is a pow very powerful tool for kind of managing these devices. So that's what a lot of apps do. They call it certificate pinning. When you download an app, it has a certificate built into it that says trust this server or, or not this server. So the final thing we implemented is we're happy now that data is encrypted. We're happy that we're talking to the correct server. The next question is, how does the server know it's talking to the correct clients? Now, when it's people, we use usernames and passwords, and, and that works very well. Um, but when these are automated systems, we want to add another level of protection. Um, because 
someone could get into that system and just pull the key off of a file or something like that um, and start to pretend to be that device. We also want to have some protection against data replay attacks. So what message signing does is we take the message that we want to send to the server and we add a digital signature, something we don't believe that anyone can forge. And within that signature, you can build it as you want, but the way that we did it was we include a hash of the information, uh, so the content of the message, and the time. So if someone takes that message, records it, and plays it back, the signature will now be invalid because the timestamp was from yesterday. Um, the other example is, if we send that data, someone intercepts it, changes one of the values in the data, and then it's received by the server, because the content has changed, the signature will be invalid. So it helps to protect against some of these common elements. Um, this is a little bit less standardized, but the route we've used is, is a fairly common route for this sort of thing. And what we do is we have a pre-shared secret so really a password between the device and the server. And that's what they use to sign the two. But we only send the signature, we never send that, um, that password, that secret key. Um, it's purely stored on the device itself. So the common technique for this is called HMAC. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, and for the life of me now, I've gone blank on what that stands for, but I have put it up. So this is hash-based message authentication code. Um, it's very much like the, you have the RSA tokens for logging to VPN at your company, or if you use the, one, the Google Authenticator app, which generates one-time passwords. It's a very similar concept. Um, possibly identical, I actually don't know quite how those work. But <laughs> um, what we do is, again, we have Bob and Alice, and we have our message, and we take the MD5 of that message. So MD5 is like a, we just generate a short, uh, sh uh, a short hash it's called, um, which would change if the message content changed. We find a way to format the time as well, and this is the bit that's a bit fuzzy. We have a, I have a way I did it, I don't know if there's a standard way to approach this, and we put it through this algorithm that generates the signature. Now the important thing in this algorithm is you can't go backwards. You can't take the app, this signature and work out what the original time was or work out what the original hash was. So that's really important, otherwise people could use that to try and then manipulate that signature. Instead what happens is when Alice receives the message, she regenerates that signature based on the information, based on the message she's received and when she's received it. And then if they match, then we're, we, we're all good, the signature's correct. Yep. So there'll be a slight variation in the format of time. If we've got Bob and Alice that. What, what's the allowance on that? So the time is tricky, and different solutions solve it in different ways. Um, the way that I've done it, um, in, in the example in a minute, is I don't format the seconds. So I only include up to the minutes in this, which means that as long as it's within the same minute, then that will be okay. But that depends on the level of security you need. Um, a more advanced version is, I was reading about how the RSA keys work, and they actually track, so well, I think they do it to the second. When they receive this key, they'll try that second, the second before, and the second after. And they will actually track that this key last time was a second fast, so next time we'll start and assume it's a second fast, and try and go back and forth, and they'll actually measure the drift over time. Um, but that's why I say that's the slightly fuzzy bit. <laughs> uh, so the good news is there is a library for this. Um, this is on the Lava forums. It's actually about six years old or so. So like I say, I'm not talking about anything necessarily new here in the realms of technology. Um, so this is on Lava from, from Tom Kwon. Um, and this actually contains a few different um, encryption libraries. Uh, the one down here, this is the HMAT we're using. Um, but this also does that hash generation, um, and it can do AES encryption, which is a symmetric encryption you can use as well. So, I have one last demo for this. So this is obviously in one 
<laughs> uh, VI. Uh, again, I don't know how well this shows up at the back of the room, so I'll just talk through it briefly. But as much as that last dot diagram explained, I've got my two frames of sequence structure here just to represent the client and the server. And I have a message which I can put in a text box on the front. I have my set time. So I take the MD5 of that message, the time, format the string and put it through this HMAP function. And I'll show you what that actually generates. Um, so that signature is just, well, obviously not random hexadecimal output, <laughs> but um, you know, for, it's nothing you can read, it's just something that can then be compared against later. Um, and then on the server, we just repeat the same thing. So obviously, if you're talking to a non lab view server, you need to use a standard technique for this um, so that you can encrypt it in lab view and it can be repeated in, uh, in that language. So that's why I would always say, you know, stick with HMAC or something that's a standard across the web for this. Um, and then if I change any one of either the message, the time, or the secret that's used on the server and the client, then that signature will fail. It will fail to verify the message, and then obviously it's down to you what you do. Um, generally, the, the point then is you want to reject it and probably report it to someone that, that something's gone wrong. So that was uh, all I had. Um, it's. Uh, Hopefully it's interesting. Uh, for some of you, maybe it's very basic. For some of you, it might be the first time you've ever seen anything like it. So uh, I wasn't too sure where to pitch it. Um, but we need to start thinking about these things a little bit more. The support actually is there already. Um, but what I think we need to do is just build a bit more awareness around these techniques. Um, and obviously, as I say, this is a very much a subset of, of, uh, of what's available. Yeah. Thank, thanks, James. Uh, I just have a question about RESTful API. I've heard the term. Could you just give us a brief introduction of what it is and what it means? Yeah, so RESTful API is basically, um, it's a web API. It runs on HTTP, but rather than producing web pages that's supposed to be rendered by a browser, it produces data normally in either JSON or XML that's supposed to be received by machines. Um, it depends on how much detail you go into it. RESTful itself is actually a very specific format for the how the URLs work as well. Not many people always follow that, and they still call it RESTful. Um, but it's, it tends to be used broad, broadly just as a HTTP API, which is designed to be received by a machine rather than a, a browser. Any other questions? Not, not really a question, but I once had a similar situation where I wanted to do uh, HTTPS and I used the uh, free tool Estelon. Which is that? Es Estelon. Estelon. So basically that's an open source tool that you can run and it will turn all your HTTP to HTTPS. Ah, okay. So then you you can basically do anything like it, even uh, network streams and have them inside the SSL tool. Oh, uh, wow, I've not come across that. It's a bit difficult to get working, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I didn't measure it for this application, actually, because we just knew we needed it. <laughs> um, so, I've never directly measured it, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, there certainly is some overhead. Um, because there's a series of handshakes that have to take place. Um, so uh, it's going to be, it's not going to be small, um, but assuming that, uh, but, but generally it's just required anyway, so you just deal with it. <laughs> I think there's any questions. Hi. Have uh, you considered VPN? VPN? So VPN is an interesting question, um, and I think there are different. Uh, previously, with all compact routers, I'd say to be very wary. And the reason is, if you have a separate router which has VPN access, if someone has physical access, they can connect and can connect to that router. Then they have they're in your network. 
Because really what VPN tends to do is extend your network to that device. So it's risky because you're now exposing your wider corporate network to anyone that can access that device. Um, that's a little improved with the new compact Rios where they have the, where you can do VPN built in. I guess that's safer because now there's not an Ethernet port someone can plug into. <laughs> um, but you have to consider, you know, I, I saw stories when researching this of people who had like, you know, photo kiosks in shops. And if you could get to Windows, you could log into their shared directories and the <laughs> server and things like that. So it's an option, but it comes with certain risks. It's really intended as a user thing, so I can decide when I'm connected and when I'm not. It, it doesn't extend well to devices that want to be always on if they are intended. <laughs> but it does provide a, the, all of the encryption, as you say, and some of the specifications. So there is certainly overlap, um, but that's the thing I would be wary of. <laughs> Any other questions? Excellent. Well, thank you very much.